It was Manfred and Isaac Nohomovitz uh, from South Africa. If you guys would just stand up. And uh, all the way from South Africa. And then sitting next to him is Mark Anthony. Just stand up for And he is a, uh, he's an intern uh, at Gateway Jewish Ministries. And he's a real blessing to us. And uh, he's actually born in Jerusalem. And although he doesn't look Jewish, he's not. <laughs> But, uh, but he is fluent in Hebrew, he's got a real heart for Israel and the Jewish people, and he's a real asset to our ministry over there. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Manfred and Iset uh, are from Johannesburg, actually from uh, Pretoria, which is close to Johannesburg, and uh, they've actually started a ministry to the Jewish people um, that has uh, really been very effective uh, in that region, and... Um, uh, us Jews are not renowned for short talks, but Manfred, I'm going to challenge you just for a short <laughs> hello. If Manfred and Isaac just, Isaac just come up a minute and just say hi, um, let's say four minutes or less. How about that? <laughs> They're really amazing friends, and they've just got a fantastic ministry in, in Johannesburg. Thanks very much. You said 40 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I left out the tea. I don't know. Four. <laughs> Take the TY off. <laughs> Well, it's really a privilege to be here, to be here with Jeff, to be here with each and every one of you. And um, the Lord is really doing amazing things in South Africa, as He's doing across the world. We started a prayer group in uh, August of 2006, and uh, this prayer group grew, and eventually we met with Jeff. The Lord uh, really arranged that we could meet with Jeff and with Gateway. And it's an amazing thing. I know Jeff for about a year, but we could have been friends for 20 years already. That's how close the Lord has just brought us. I, I just love Jeff. He's just an amazing guy, and um, you're going to be blessed this, this morning by him. And um, this is my wife. She's, uh, I said, her name is very easy to remember. You stand, I sit. Okay. <laughs> I sit. Her name's I sit. Okay, getting back to our ministry. Uh, we started off as a prayer group. The Lord then connected us with Gateway, and we went back to South Africa, and we began uh, Shabbat services, Messianic services, also the first Friday of every month. And from there, this ministry just started growing as God opened up doors. We have a dual calling. Our One calling is to minister the gospel to the Jewish people, to just bring Jesus to them and get the Jewish people saved. And the other part of our ministry is to get the truth of, of getting the gospel out to the Jewish people, to the body of Christ. Um, oftentimes the body of Christ feels that, uh, senses that it doesn't need to take the gospel out to the Jewish people. They're saved by their own government and various other reasons. This is not so. There's only one way to salvation, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore we need to get this truth out into the church in South Africa, and that's the second part of our ministry. And God has been very effective. We're getting amazing open doors. In fact, we've just had an open door recently to a church in South Africa, which has a membership of 17,000 people. And uh, t for them to, be, um, to, to, to just be embracing Jewish ministry within their uh, global division, their outreach division, is amazing. So we give God all the glory. We do nothing. We just step back and say, God, this is your ministry, and he takes it to where he wants it to go. So I just encourage you. Nothing is impossible with God. He's awesome. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He's, he's glorious. And we just give him all the glory and all the honor. Thank you. Bless you guys. Amen. Did you want to say anything for a minute? Okay. I'm proud of you. You made it less than four minutes. I mean, come on. <laughs> for any Jewish person to speak less than that is, I'm Jewish, so I can make Jewish jokes. You're not allowed to, okay? So, <laughs> all right. I'll swap to the, back to the other one. But, um, well, you know, when people first hear my accent, and normally I'm the only one with this accent, but now you heard someone with even a stronger accent than me, and, uh, and you hear, you know, Jewish and from South Africa and believer in Jesus, and so just to make everything very simple, I just tell people I'm a Jewish Christian African American. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the summarized version, because I'm Jewish, I'm from South Africa, I believe in Jesus, and uh, anyway, you get the picture. So, <laughs> Well, let's just pray right now. Father, Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that your word is truth. 
And Lord God, I just pray you that your word, your truth, will go forth today with great power. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Well, it's really a, a, a blessing and an honor to uh, be invited to, to minister. I never, ever take it for granted. Uh, to minister the Word of God is always a privilege. This is my first time in Granbury. And uh, I think I'm possibly the first Jewish South African in Granbury. If you know of any others, I'd love to meet them. Well, there's one well, next to you, so there's two of us. <laughs> and um, you're right, you're from Zimbabwe, right, originally? Johannesburg, oh wow, so that's, that's fantastic. So it's a, The world's just shrinking, isn't it? It's so amazing how international it is when you're in the Lord. Um, but anyway, um, it's just a real privilege to minister His Word. And uh, I'll give you my very brief testimony, like extremely brief because that's not what I'm sharing today, but just to give you my background. Um, like Manfred, uh, I was raised uh, Orthodox Jewish in South Africa, 90% or even more than 90% of South African Jews are Orthodox. <clears throat> also, uh, 90% of South African Jews are from Lithuania originally. Is your family from there as well, Manfred? Yeah, but, but, but most 90% of South African Jews are from Lithuania, including my grandparents uh, as well. And uh, so anyway, um, that's, the, that's kind of the background. And uh, I went to Hebrew school for 10 years, learned to read and write Hebrew. At the same time, I learned to read and write English. Um, I can read and write Hebrew. I'm not as fluent as Manfred. He's pretty fluent in Hebrew. Uh, but it's just part of our DNA growing up, you know, knowing that Israel's our homeland. And uh, even though we were raised in South Africa, that's just, it just wasn't an issue. It just was, that's just how it was, you know. And uh, I actually remembered, imagine at the age of five, it being so strongly ingrained on you uh, how what it means to be Jewish in this world. At the age of five, my earliest memory in life is the 1967 war when Israel was at war. And thank God it only lasted six days. Um, but I remember at the tender age of five, in fact, I was in kindergarten, I still remember this. And to me, Israel winning that war is what my survival depended upon. That's, how, that's what I felt. I felt like if Israel doesn't win this war, the Jews around the world are in danger once again. And at the tender age of five, I was just so afraid that Israel was going to lose that war. And thank God, I only had six days of stress. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that's, so that's my, my background. And then uh, I went to live in Israel after I finished my military service in South Africa. I spent some time living on a kibbutz there. And I'd never, ever considered the claims of Jesus until when I was in the army someone began to witness to me. And he was a, well, he wasn't really a Christian. He was actually in a cult, but I wouldn't have known a Christian in a cult or any other kind of Christian, you know. At that point, I mean, if you weren't Jewish or Muslim and you were a Westerner, you were a Christian, I wouldn't have known the difference. But, uh, but anyway, um, this guy began to talk to me about Jesus. And finally, I said, look, you know, Jews don't believe in Jesus. So just, I appreciate your sincerity, but I'm not interested. And he gave me Psalm 22, which I began to read, and for those of you not familiar with it, it describes the whole crucifixion of Jesus uh, in, to the minutest detail. Only one problem is it's written by King David 700 years before there's such a form of punishment as crucifixion. And so I gave it back to him. I said, well, thanks very much, but this is the New Testament. Jews don't read the New Testament. <laughs> and he said, no, it's not. This is written by King David. And I'm like, what? And then I looked again, and I was very confused, but it seemed like this is talking about Jesus. So I, uh, sorry to interrupt, but let's, can someone bring me a glass of water? I, my mouth gets dry when I speak sometimes. Thank you. Um, but anyway, so uh, it, I didn't know what to do about this. It seems to be talking about Jesus. It was in the Old Testament. So I, I concluded that what this was, this was a Christian plot to convert Jews. And I thought, well, it was probably an NIV Bible or something like that the guy gave me. I thought, well, this is written by Christians, which to me meant non-Jews. It was what a Christian was to me. Um, and, uh, and they don't know any Hebrew, and so they just kind of translate it in such a way to make it sound like it's Jesus. And so I kind of satisfied myself with that explanation. Uh, but when I was on leave uh, from the army, I went to my grandmother's house, and they always had a lot of Old Testaments and things in Hebrew, and I read the Hebrew and the rabbi's translation. And to my surprise, 
it was very, very much, not identical, but very, very close to what I just read uh, in the, you know, what I call the Christian version of the Bible. <laughs> anyway, so I was in a dilemma, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know any, anything about receiving Jesus or being born again. I thought that uh, the only born again people all belonged to the Rhema Church, because the only big church I knew, there was a very big Rhema Church in Johannesburg, and I thought they started a cult called the Born Again Movement. That's all I knew. <laughs> And I knew they all had fishes on their car, and I didn't like fishes on my car, so I just felt that's not for me. And uh, so anyway, that was about all that I knew. So many things happened. I went through many trials, ended up uh, going to college uh, in New York City, living in New York. Uh, while I was in New York for that year, um, I, it seemed like I had everything that any young man would want. Thank you so much, Pastor. Appreciate it. And I mean, it seemed I, had, I had everything. I was, I was getting education. Uh, I had popularity. People liked my accent. They didn't understand it a lot of the time, but they liked it. And, um, and anyway, I just had everything going for me. I mean, I had what other guys wanted. And little did they know was that deep inside there was an emptiness and there was a void in my heart. And only God knew that. So I went back to Israel in the summer of 84. And I was working on the same kibbutz. Uh, that I'd lived at before called Shvayim Kibbutz between Tel Aviv and Netanya in Israel. And uh, I went to Jerusalem. I used to go, uh, always go to the Arab market, what they call the Shuk in Hebrew, the Arab market. And I used to go and shopping, getting some deals uh, there. It's kind of fun because you could bargain them down to good prices. And, uh, and Jesus appeared to me three times. And uh, all I can say, I, I won't go into all, all the three times, but all I can say is that when Jesus appears to you, <laughs> believe me, people say, how do you know? You know, you know if Jesus appears to you, you, you know it. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt. And he looked at me with his most incredible love that words can never, ever express. And I knew immediately that this was more than a man. I knew immediately that he loved me with a perfect and unconditional love. And I knew that he knew everything that I'd ever done or said whatever I would do, and that he still loved me with an unconditional and perfect love. And I knew immediately that this is everything that I'd ever wanted in my life. And obviously, that was a very, very powerful, moving experience, uh, which I don't have time to go into all the details now. But it was actually about a month later when finally I received the Lord um, at a Bible study uh, of Jews for Jesus in L.A. It was actually during the Olympics in 1984. Uh, Olympics that were in Los Angeles at that time. That was the beginning of a great journey. I received the Lord into my heart. And uh, I didn't know exactly what I was after that. Well, am I a Christian? Am I a Jew? Am I a Jewish Christian? Am I a born-again Jew? I don't have to put a fish on my calf. Should I not have a fish on my calf? You know, all kinds of big decisions I make, had to make. But the most important thing uh, I knew was that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah of Israel, and that I had received him, and that I would loved peace and joy. And that, that was August the 14th, 1984. That was 24 years ago, over 24 years. And uh, I can honestly say there's not a moment, not a moment, that I haven't known that God is with me. And yes, life has not been a bed of roses, but I could not imagine walking all that way without him. I don't know how I survived for 22 years before then, quite frankly. I guess by his grace that I have now. So anyway, that's the highly summarized version, probably the shortest version of my testimony that I've ever spoken. <laughs> and, um, and the Lord uh, called me not only to preach the gospel, to, but to bring the gospel to my people, to the Jewish people. And so the, the title of my message today is being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded. And uh, I want to sort of kind of start off the message with a challenge uh, to all of us. What are you fully persuaded about? What are you fully persuaded about? And so just let that, uh, just meditate on that as I'm sharing and, and, and just see what settles in your heart, what remains and what the Lord takes out. But I really believe that uh, in a world that's ever-changing, that we live in today, that it's a time and a season for us to reevaluate what we are truly fully persuaded about. 
Because the truth is, whatever you're fully persuaded about is what you're going to live out. If we just have a mental understanding or just a, a mental knowledge of something or just a belief intellectually, um, uh, if we're not acting on our belief, it's not a belief, truly. Are you all following me? And yes, we say it by grace through faith alone, not of works lest any man should boast. 100% by faith through grace through the blood of Jesus. But when you have faith, there's conviction that comes with that faith, and that conviction leads to action. That's why you're having that outreach to reach those foreign students in, uh, in Irving or wherever it is in the Dallas area. Why? Because you say by grace through faith, but that leads you to a conviction that other people need what you have. You're following me. And so true faith will always lead to action. So let's look at uh, the father of our faith, Abraham, and see what, uh, what his faith uh, led him to do and how it affected him. So let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 4 and have a brief look at Abraham. And now we know how God promised him a son, uh, but he was very old. And uh, so was his wife, and her womb was as good as dead, the Bible says. And so that's the context. And let me just share with you along those lines, starting in verse 18 of Romans 4. Speaking of Abraham, it says, Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And then it says this, it's pretty remarkable, verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, already did, since he was about a hundred years old. And boy, if, if someone uh, was a hundred years old and and had a child. In fact, he was older than 100 when, when Isaac was born, I guess 101 or something. Um, it would probably be the front page of the, the paper, and uh, let alone you know, Sarah conceiving when her womb was supposed to be dead. Or, you know, it's, it's in fact, it was dead. Uh, but then it says, but not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Now, here's what's amazing. Faith doesn't deny the facts. Because it simply says, he did not consider his own body already dead. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't dead. He was moving around. You know, he could walk, you know. It wasn't like, but he considered, you know, you know, I don't have to be graphic. You know what I mean? It's already dead. <laughs> you know, they didn't have things to help you in those days that, like they have today. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that, you know. His body was already dead. He didn't contend that. You know, so there's many miracles we don't even think about that happened for that conception to happen. Not only that, not only was his body dead, but Sarah's womb was dead as well. So it doesn't deny the facts. But it says he didn't consider the facts. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He didn't say he didn't know his body was dead. He said he didn't consider it. Now, it wasn't a question. It wasn't an issue. He did not consider the facts, if you want to make it in just simple terms. The facts didn't matter. All that mattered was that God had given him a promise. Nothing else mattered. Nothing else moved him. Those, that is faith. That is true faith. And we, talk about strong faith, we are the fruit of his faith. All of us sitting in this room. <laughs> talk about faith that lasts. Simply because he didn't consider the facts. He didn't deny the facts. He wasn't in denial. He wasn't like an ostrich that hides his head in the sand. But he didn't, in other words, the facts are relevant. I don't care about the facts. God has said it, and that's all that matters. That is faith. You see, the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. A substance is something you can touch, taste, feel, that you can feel with your senses. You see, faith is so real, it's a spiritual sense that is more... If someone says, well, you know, you, you ever shared with someone and they say, oh, I tried that? You ever, you ever had anyone say that? It's like, no, you didn't. Well, what did you try? You prayed some vague prayer. You didn't try anything. You don't try God. God tries us. <laughs> he doesn't need to be tried. <laughs> We're the ones who need to be tried and tested. Are you all following me? And so, it says, He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. And then I love this. But was strengthened in his faith. Wow. Although the facts are completely the opposite of what, everything that God said. Every fact. Said Abraham didn't consider them. 
They weren't, it was irrelevant. But the facts were completely irrelevant. He was unmoved. Not only wasn't he weakened in the faith, in his faith, but it says he was strengthened in faith. The worse the facts were, the stronger his faith got. <laughs> and then not only that, but it says he was giving glory to God. And now I'm using the New King James here, but I'm going to quote the NIV for verse 21. But in the, in, the, in the NIV it says, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Fully persuaded. Abraham was fully persuaded that God was able to give him this heir, this child. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. And as I said, True faith will always lead to action. So Abraham acted upon that faith. Now, here's what's encouraging. Not to digress, but just to make this point briefly. You know, he's in the hall of faith, the biblical hall of fame, you could say. You know, he got into, he made it into Hebrews 11. (laughs) And many other places too, but he made it into Hebrews 11. And it talks about how he had this unwavering faith. And then, so I was reading Abraham's life in the Old Testament and Genesis and all that and seeing what he, he lied about his wife and said it's actually his sister and then Pharaoh ended up taking her in and Pharaoh almost got smote by God because he almost went with Abraham's wife and didn't know it was his wife and then God had to show him in a dream he mustn't go with her and Abraham had to go and, and you know, God saved him and then, I mean, you just go through his life. I mean, all the trials that he went through and then God promises him a child and we know he goes with Hagar because he thought, you know, Sarah was too, too old and her, her womb was dead, etc. And yet it says that his faith was unwavering. And so, you know, it's so wonderful. On the one hand, this incredible faith. On the other hand, this incredible humanness. <laughs> you know, and so uh, I think that, I don't know about you, but that helps me. And so you see, there's a difference between questioning God as in questioning his word. And, and, and questioning in a, in a healthy way. In other words, Lord, I believe your word, but how? You know, remember when, when uh, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, questioned the angel. He was questioning if he could do it. <laughs> and so that, that's, God wasn't too impressed with that. You know, <laughs> so he couldn't speak until the baby was born. But then Mary also questioned when the angel said, you're going to have a child. And God wasn't the least bit angry or upset or anything. Because she was simply saying, Basically, okay, well, and I'm going to have this baby, but how? I mean, that's pretty reasonable, seeing no one has ever fallen pregnant without going with a man in all of history. I, mean, I think it's a fairly reasonable, don't you think, question? So she wasn't questioning, could God do it? She was just, well, okay, well, just help me with some methodology here. Just, you know, just how is it going to happen? You know what I'm saying? And so, so here's my point. And so, so I questioned the Lord in, a, in that healthy way. And I said, God, but your word says that Abraham never wavered. But I mean, I look at his life, he looks like one big waver from beginning to end. <laughs> so just, Lord, I'm not questioning your word, but I'm just a bit confused, just help me to understand. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly, God, God is not threatened if you have questions, just so you know. You know, feel, have an honest, God loves honesty, because if you've got doubts anyway, God knows it. It's not like, you know what I mean, it's, it comes as a great shock to him, you know. You know it's like, oh, you completely threw me off, child, I had no idea, you know what I mean. <laughs> So I, got, I said, Lord, I just help me to understand, you know, because, it, I mean, it looked like he wavered all the time. And the Lord gave me such a clear and simple answer. Is that Abraham, just like the Bible says, he never wavered at the promise. He wavered at the method. <laughs> How? Are you all following me? How many of you has God ever spoken to you and shown you, you need to do this, or you're going to be a pastor, or you're going to be in this kind of, bu- or that kind of business, and then you go and you try and do what God has shown you you're going to do, and then it completely falls to the ground. And then you question yourself. Did I hear from God in the first place? Did I miss it? No, you heard from God. Because his sheep know his voice. He doesn't even say how his sheep know his voice. He just said his sheep know his voice. But then you try to fulfill what God told you in the way that you thought it was supposed to be fulfilled, and then you get discouraged when it doesn't happen the way that you wanted to make it happen. No, God just said it's going to happen. He didn't say how. I say that to encourage you. If God has spoken to you, maybe you've wavered at the method. 
but don't waver at the message. You follow me? Don't waver at the promise because the, when God speaks it, it will come to pass. Amen? So Abraham was fully persuaded that he'd become an heir of the nations, that he'd have a child who uh, supernaturally he was going to have, Isaac, through the Lord, what the Lord brought about. So I'm just going to share three things that I'm fully persuaded about. The first thing I'm fully persuaded about, and you know, this is very basic, but I think it's time to come back to the basics. Rather be strong in a few basics than have tons of knowledge and not apply any of it. Are you all following me? The first thing I'm fully persuaded about is that the gospel message, the eternal gospel, is the only hope for mankind. Not, not one hope or one nice option, not, not a hope, but the gospel message is the only hope for mankind. You know, I'll never forget when I first got saved, and uh, all my roommates and friends were also South African Jews as well, and I mean, you know, I, you can't find accommodation in New York, so I had to stay where I was, and I mean, I got persecuted, like, you wouldn't believe, I mean, they, they used to... I'd call one of my friends to speak to them. I'd say, hey, can I speak to Linda? They'd say, oh, Linda, it's Jesus on the phone. You know what I mean? I mean, all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, really, the first 19 months were really tough. And, uh, but I just stood firm. And all of a sudden, I mean, my eyes were opened. And I was just thinking, so you mean? And my, my friend who I was witnessing to, my Jewish roommate, he said, are you trying to tell me that every single person who doesn't believe like you believe is going to hell? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I mean, because it's very hard. I mean, it sounds like we're really dogmatic, you know, and prideful. You know what I mean? But we're not. But it's, that's the, how the world sees it. And I said, yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much wisdom, you know, in how I shared in those days. But, you know. <laughs> and then I was in New York City and just thousands of people everywhere. And, like, how many of those are actually born again? Have a born again relationship? And, and I mean, it's just mind-boggling. You know, and of course, you know, each of us has to be obedient and do our part. But if we are fully persuaded that that's the truth, that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life, surely it will lead to action. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Richard Wormbrand. Um, you'd call him Wormbrand, I guess. Um, but it's the W is pronounced as a V, where I come from anyway. But anyway, uh, he's a Jewish believer who went to be with the Lord a few years ago, and he was known as the father of the underground church in Romania. He was imprisoned and tortured horribly for 14 years. First of all, for seven years, then he was released on condition that he doesn't preach the gospel. Uh, he continued preaching the gospel. <laughs> and wherever he'd preach, houses would be packed. Finally, the secret police caught him again. He was imprisoned and tortured for another seven years. And I had the privilege of meeting him, and, and many, many people, finally, when the government was overthrown, the evil communist government, uh, most people believe that he was the catalyst and the father of the underground church in Romania for that to happen. And so um, I had the privilege of meeting him, and uh, he shared a story in one of his books where he was sharing with a communist while he was in prison. Because in a communist system, what would happen is, is that if a government leader, uh, it could be very high in government, but if he didn't do exactly what the party wanted, you know, he could be in jail the next day. So it was a heartless, ruthless system. So one of these ex-government officials was in prison with Richard Wormbrandt, and he was sitting on a stool. And uh, they were talking, and Richard Wormbrandt had been sharing the gospel with everybody, and, and he said, you know what, I, I just, the, the, the communists believe, that they call it materialism, I don't know if you ever heard of this, but I was, basically what it is, they believe that the only thing that's real is physical material, only things you can see, touch, feel, etc. So he said, that's all that matters, that's all that's real is physical material, and I'm a materialist. And he's sitting on the stool. And so Richard Wurmbrand, he was a really big guy. Of course, he was half starved in prison, but he was a big guy. And uh, he's about 6'2", six, 6'3", six, six, and he came, and he kicks out the stool from under the guy with all of his strength. And the stool goes flying. <laughs> the guy goes flying and hits himself, you know, on the floor, like, really hard. And he gets up, and he's very angry, as you can imagine. He wants to have a big fight with Richard Wurmbrand. And he says, why are you so angry? What, what, what's wrong? What have I done wrong? He says, well... You know, you, you just kicked this chair out for me. What are you talking about? He said, well, it's just 
material. I mean, the chair doesn't seem so upset, so why are you upset? <laughs> the point is he's saying that we have a soul. We have a spirit. We're not just material. And then this, what this guy said to him, he said, you know what? Most of these guys ended up getting saved through his ministry. And he said, you really believe that everyone who doesn't believe in Jesus is going to go to hell? He said, we really believe in this communist message. And they, took it, they, they overtook most of the world all those years ago. And they said, wow, if you Christians have the same conviction about your message that we have about the communist message, <laughs> you guys would take over the world with the gospel in a short amount of time. And he was challenged by this communist. He has someone who'd given his life for a lie. And they'd taken over most of the world. We've given our lives for the only truth that can save anybody. Are you getting the heart of what I'm saying? We all know in Acts 4.12, it says there's no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.15 says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So basically from the day I got saved until now, 24, over 24 years, I've preached the gospel to whoever, wherever, however. <laughs> Started off preaching in the streets of New York. I've preached in nursing homes, prisons, uh, radio, television, churches, messianic synagogues. And I was, I said, Lord, whether it's one, whether it's two, whether it's a big crowd, small crowd, it makes no difference to me. Just let me preach the gospel. Because it's the only message that can bring hope to the world. It is the only message. In fact, uh, just very recently, in fact, uh, I'm trying to think what month it is. I'm losing track of time. I think it was June of this year. Me and my wife were invited to go and preach in Indonesia in Sumatra. In Sumatra, over the last few years, a lot of pastors have been martyred. A lot of churches have been burned. And, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't particularly excited, <laughs> being that it's the largest Muslim nation in the world, Indonesia. And I'm Jewish and a Messianic Jew. Uh, but anyway, without going into all the details, I prayed for months and the Lord said, no, go. And uh, it was a supernatural time for us to even get into the country. And we saw over about 200 people saved many of the Muslims. And what? Yeah, we can give it all a hand for that. Why? Why? Why would I do that? Because I'm fully persuaded that the gospel is the only hope for mankind. Secondly, I'm just going to share three things I'm fully persuaded about. There are more, but I mean these are three core values for me. I'm fully persuaded, not only that the gospel is the only hope for mankind, but I'm fully persuaded that the gospel message is to the Jew first. And that the biblical pattern for taking the gospel into the world is by, t for take, by taking it to the Jew first. You know, I, I make a statement in churches that sometimes shocks, shocks people, and I say, I say well, that's great because you call it a Jewish ministry. And I say, no, every single Christian Every born-again believer who believes the Word of God is called to Jewish ministry. Of course, that's, a, you know, it's like, who are you to tell me I'm called to Jewish ministry? Well, I'm telling you. <laughs> you can hear a pin drop, right? <laughs> you say, well, how am I called to Jewish ministry? Well, we're all called to fulfill the Great Commission, number one. And the pattern for the Great Commission is to the Jew first. Now, I'm not saying everyone's called to be a missionary and go into the nations and all that kind of thing. But I am saying this, everyone's called to the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is to the Jew first. So you can all do one of three things when it comes to Jewish ministry. Everybody can pray. Everyone who has a relationship with Jesus can pray. You can pray for the salvation of Israel, number one. Number two, you can support, which you guys already are doing as a, as a church. I was just talking to a pastor earlier on. You can support ministries that are taking the gospel to the Jews. Or number three, you yourself <laughs> take the gospel to the Jews. So now you understand, now that I've qualified my statement, that every believer is called to Jewish ministry. If you're called to take the gospel, to fulfill the Great Commission, you're called to Jewish ministry. And, you know, so, you know, 
with our emphasis uh, at Gateway of taking the gospel to the Jew first. Of course, it gets challenged. So some people think, well, that's a gateway thing. That's, a, that's not a gateway thing. It's a God thing. I've been doing it for 24 years. I've only been a gateway for five years. <laughs> we do it out of conviction. We do it because the Word of God says to do it. I don't have time to go into all of the scriptures and all the arguments why that is the case. But let me just narrow it down to a few things. Romans 1.16. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. And everybody would say a hearty amen to that. And that's preached from pulpits all around the country and all around the world. But normally, not in this church, but normally, <laughs> they stop at that part. I don't know why they just leave out the last quarter of the verse, because it's just, maybe they don't know what to do with it, they don't know how to deal with it. But it's not only the power of God for salvation to all who believes, but then it gives the order. And it says, to the Jew first. And also to the Greek, Greek standing for Gentile or non-Jew. So people struggle with it sometimes, you know, and it gets challenged. And um, first thing I want to say, people say, oh, you just base that just on one scripture. Um, I have a, a series, uh, it's on DVD and CD, you can order it at gatewaypeople.com if you want to listen to it. But where the, the first hour, all I teach on, it's all scripture, is just only why the gospel is to the Jew first. All the biblical precedent and biblical background. You see, the Old Testament was to the Jew only. The New Testament is to the Jew first. Let me explain what I mean. The Old Testament, if you want to become a true believer, remember how the New Testament speaks about proselytes? A proselyte is someone who wasn't Jewish but who converted and, and, and became part of the commonwealth of Israel. It speaks of proselytes and God-fearing Gentiles. God-fearing Gentiles, they couldn't go into the temple because it wasn't allowed le legally but because they, weren't, they hadn't actually become Jews. Uh, but they were God-fearing. They worshipped the God of Israel. They would honor and bless the Jewish people. And they were God-fearing. I believe God-fearing Gentiles would, would be in heaven. You know, people like Cornelius and those you know, uh, attached to, to him, those kinds of people who loved the Jewish people. Um. But you had to become part of the commonwealth of Israel because in those days, the covenant was the old covenant and you had to become part of the old covenant to come into relationship with God, with God's people. And so now that the gospel message has come, it's come for all mankind, but it came to the Jewish people and through the Jewish people. And, and here's, I think, where people get confused with this whole thing of going to the Jew first. Number one, sometimes they'll... They think we're being, you know, they're, they're taking a legalistic way. And they think, oh, well, if I go to any city or, or country, I can't preach to any Gentiles. I've got to find a Jew first and preach to them. You know, I mean, some people are just so legalistic. You tell them anything, I mean, they'll make it into, a, you know, legalism. It's not a law. It's a principle. It's a principle. So, okay, so why? Does it, so then people think, well, that means that God loves Jews more than Gentiles. No, it doesn't. Maybe someone's insecure if they think that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> God loves us equally. But here's the thing. Let, let me just paint a picture for you, okay? Who, who had the word of God when Jesus came into the world? Who had it? The Jews. Who knew the word of God? The Jews. Who had this, the temple worship, the sacrifice? Who had the law and the prophets and all those things and the covenants? So can you imagine... In those days, when you think of Gentiles in those days, don't think of Gentiles as you do today. Gentile meant pagan in those days. Now, I mean, in America, there's, you know, most of America's Gentiles, but mostly God, well, it's not mostly anymore, but many, many God-fearing Gentiles. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you think of, they're either a Catholic or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or an Episcopalian or whatever denomination it is, but there's, there's some sort of semblance of the knowledge of the Word of God. You see, in those days, Gentiles, had, they didn't know the Word of God at all. They would have been worshipping deities and making sacrifices to animals and sacrificing their children and, and having doing despicable things I wouldn't, wouldn't even want to mention from the pulpit, you know, in those temples. So can you imagine, for those people that didn't have the word of God at all, imagine if the gospel came to them first? What, we wouldn't have the gospel today. We'd have some weird hybrid aberration mixture of that and pagan worship. We wouldn't have the gospel, the pure word of God. So it had to come to the Jewish people, God's covenant people. That's why Paul the Apostle wrote it and not Zeus or Apollos. 
or, you know, Aphrodites or whoever, whatever their names were in those days, you know, those Greek names. It's because God loves the whole world that he brought the gospel to the Jewish people first. So that we could have the full word of God. So thank God we had someone who knew the Old Testament better than anybody in the world at that time who could write most of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, and the Jewish disciples. So that they kept on referring back to the law and the prophets and Moses and the Psalms so that this makes sense. <laughs> Are you all following me? So then some people say, okay, well, well, that was back then. You know, it, it came to the Jews first, but does, does, is it still for us today? And I say, absolutely, yes. It's still for us today. Because God's pattern and his precedent has not changed. First of all, Jesus himself. Let's just go really quickly, do a quick Bible study here, just to give you some scriptures. Uh, Matthew 15. And as I say, you can get the, the tape series uh, on the web or I can mail them to the church if, uh, if Pastor Alan wants me to do that. Um, Matthew 15, starting in verse 24. First of all, Jesus himself was called specifically to Israel, to the Jewish people while he was here on the earth. It says, Jesus himself, it's the words in red, saying, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there's a whole context there which we don't have time to get into now. But so Jesus himself was called to the Jews. He said, okay, well, what about the disciples? Okay, let's go to Matthew 10. Go back to Matthew 10 and look at the first original commission to the disciples, starting in verse 5. It says, then these 12 Jesus sent and commanded them, saying... And look how he starts off with a commission to the disciples. He says, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. So he, he tells them first who not to go to. <laughs> then, not only does he say that, but he goes one step further. He says, don't even enter into a city of the Samaritans. Now, so the Samaritans were at least partly Jewish. You think at least go to them. You know, they were at least hybrids or whatever, you know. But he says, no, don't even go to those who are partially Jewish. Now, if you didn't understand, you'd think, what, is this some kind of prejudice? No. He says, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there's exactly the same calling that Jesus himself had, he gives to the disciples. It's why, why? It's for the very reasons that I explained to you, because we would not have the pure gospel that we have today, built on the foundation of the law and the prophets. We wouldn't have it if the gospel was not brought to the Jews by Jesus, and then disciples. Now that all being said, and I don't have time to get into this now, but if you look at Jesus' ministry, he would minister to Gentiles all the time. Not all the time, but much of the time. And this was a particular case, uh, what I read earlier on, where Jesus, said, where, where Jesus said himself that I'm called only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because there was a, a Canaanite woman who wanted deliverance. And the only reason he didn't bring her deliverance immediately is because he wanted to emphasize first that they'd understand that, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm touching Gentiles because I love all people and I'm ministering to, to everybody while I'm here on this earth. But I want you guys to understand that my primary calling is to the Jewish people while I'm here on earth. And that you'll see the context of that when you read it in your own time. You say, okay, so Jesus was called to the Jews. He sent the early disciples to the Jews. But, you know, what about us? So why don't we go on to the book of Acts and see after the resurrection... Uh, if that's precedence changed. In fact, let's start off in Acts chapter 3. Starting in verse uh, 24 and very, verse 25. This is when Peter is speaking uh, to a large crowd uh, after uh, someone had just been healed. And he, and he rose up and walked, and you know that situation, and then he was challenged, um, and he began to preach the gospel to the Jewish people, told them to repent and to receive Jesus as the Messiah, and he, he preaches an amazing sermon, and then he, we, so he goes to that context up to verse 24, he says, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. And then he's speaking clearly to a Jewish audience because he says in verse 25, which shows he's speaking to Jews, uh, 
You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, which obviously is Jewish people, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then look what Paul says in verse 26. He says, to you first, to you first, speaking to Jews, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from your iniquities. And so that's why he says to you first, because that's the biblical pattern. So let's, okay, so maybe that was just one random case. So let's, let's just go on a little bit further and go to, um, to Acts 13. Let's just go along further to Acts 13, where Paul was ministering in, in Antioch. And uh, we'll go all the way up to 42. Now remember, every single time that Paul would go into any city, Gentile cities, all around Europe and Asia, wherever he was, uh, he would immediately go to the synagogue. Now, why would Paul go to the synagogue if he was called to the Gentiles? Because he was following a biblical pattern. So starting at verse... 42, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes, which I described to you what proselytes were, or converts, followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now the reason I'm going to read this context is that I've heard many people over the years, being in ministry for 24 years, you have all the arguments against it. And people say, yes, but then something happened when Paul the Apostle um, turned away from going to the Jewish people. And he said, from now on, we're going to the Gentiles. And that's when that pattern stopped. And I've heard theologians who are educated, ignorant, but educated, saying that, you know, I'm ignorant of Scripture, that this is the case. So that's why I'm sharing this. So... um, so many of the, the Jewish converts and proselytes followed Paul and, 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 the, and uh, Barnabas around. And the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Verse 44. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. So notice here, he said it was necessary. Whether you accept it or reject it. It's, and now necess- why is it necessary? Because it's God's pattern. It's not based on your acceptance. Although, we, of course, that's what we're praying for. And we share it in such a way that the gospel is attractive to them. So it was necessary the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. So that's when it ended. Paul's ministry was solely to the Gentiles from that time onwards. <laughs> so many say. But they forgot to read the rest of the book of Acts. And so they say that's when God turned away from the Jews and started going to the Gentiles. So let's just read on to see if that's true because, you know, we need to consider any argument if it can be backed up. So behold, we turn to the Gentiles, which of course the Gentiles were happy, as, as anybody would be. In verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many has, as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women of, and chief men of the city, raised up persecution, and expelled them from the region. So they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. Okay, so they've now made this proclamation. The gospel is going to the Gentiles now, no longer to the Jews. Shook the dust off their feet, and now it's over with Jewish ministry from that time onwards. So let's see if that's the case. So let's go to the next city they went to, Acts 14. Now it happened in Iconium. Okay, so they're going to a Gentile city, so maybe this is true. That they went together, where? To the synagogue of the Jews. In Iconium. I mean, who's going to go look for a synagogue in Iconium? Would you look for a synagogue if you went to Iconium? I don't even know where Iconium is. I guess I should study more on that. It's not Israel, that's for sure. So there he is in Iconium. He goes straight to the synagogue of the Jews. And so spoke that a great multitude, both of Jews and of Greeks. So after he made this proclamation that ministry to the Jews is over, 
the very next Shabbat, which would have been just a few days later, he goes straight to the synagogue, and many Jews get saved and Gentiles. And then you carry on reading the book of Acts, and you'll see over and over again how not only Jews, but many priests, even high priests, came to the Lord after this. So isn't it amazing how somebody can take one scripture, and I'm sure you've heard the saying, but a, a scripture without a context is a pretext. <laughs> the point is, is that God's pattern never changes. Before I come to my last point, I just want to share something that, that is really amazing, an amazing fact. And that is, think of it this way. In the first century, there was no television, there was no internet, there was no advertising. I mean, there was nothing. The guys would just go on foot preaching the gospel, get stoned, beaten up, and if they survived, they would carry on preaching, go to the next city, you know. And uh, basically, it was, uh, you know, like a ministry of, of fleeing and persecution and preaching the gospel from town to town. That's why Jesus says, you won't finish going through the cities of Israel till the Son of Man comes. So with none of those things available, in, in the first century, most of the believers were Jewish. That began to change towards the end of the first century. But just think of this. The whole known world had the gospel preached to them. When the pattern of going to the Jew first was followed. Just think of that. Why? Simply because they were following God's pattern. Sometimes they'd accept it. Sometimes they'd reject it. Sometimes Paul would get stoned. Sometimes he'd be kicked out. Sometimes they'd receive him. Sometimes they wouldn't. But regardless, he never wavered from the pattern. And he's called to the Gentiles. He's not called to the Jews. And I really believe, and you know, I don't have time to go into the historical, the history of the church from the first century until now, but I really believe that abandoning the precedent not a law, but a principle, a precedent, abandoning the precedent of taking the gospel to the Jew first really opened up the door to a whole Pandora's box, whether it be Islam, whether it be you know, the, the church just gradually dying a death in the Middle Ages and that whole period. It opened up the door to replacement theology and eventually the Spanish Inquisition, ultimately the Holocaust. I mean, it's very dangerous. You, you, you leave the foundation, you leave the biblical precedent, and you're opening yourself up to all kinds. Because you just go off one degree a hundred years ago, and you know what I mean? And then you just end up completely missing it. You know, at, uh, at Gateway, we have uh, began to have pastors' conferences, etc., over the last few years. And, you know, Gateway's experienced incredible growth. And, uh, and whenever, whenever there's a lot of church growth, you know, everybody wants to know, well, what's the secret to the church growth? You know, how come it's grown so quickly? And, and pastors will ask Pastor Robert, and he'll say publicly, I believe the reason that God is so blessed is from day one, just as you've done at this church. The gospel, we've taken the gospel to the Jew first, the, the, the biblical precedent. We followed that precedent, and God has blessed us because of that. And does it mean that if someone's not taking the, fulfilling the Great Commission to the Jew first, that God loves them less, or that, you know, none of it? No, of course not. But why would you want to have anything less than the fullness of God's blessing? It's like, well, it's like if you're not baptized. Well, will you still go to heaven? Yes. But are you being obedient? No. Are you going to have a, a life with much less power? Yes. <laughs> much less victory? Yes. Well, if you want a life with much less power and victory, you still go to heaven? Okay. Because <laughs> the thief on the cross still went there because he couldn't physically be baptized. And I believe to the Jew first is simply an act of obedience, not, not just clinical obedience, but out of love. And you know, in Israel today, maybe 20 years ago, it was almost unheard of, maybe one or two small little struggling congregations. Today in Israel, we have about 120 congregations throughout the land. I mean, as, the, as, the, as God is opening the eyes of the church and they're beginning to share with the Jewish people, part of the outpouring and the restoration of Israel is the church coming back to the Jew first. It's incredible. The church has a massive role to play. You, you speak to any Jewish believer. I, I, this is a very conservative figure. I think it's over 90%. But I know that I can confidently say well over 70% of all Jews come to the Lord through Gentiles. Why? Because they believe in bringing the gospel to the Jews. 
If you don't believe it, you wouldn't do it. <laughs> but for so long, and still to this day, there's a theology that says the gospel is not for the Jewish people. And I don't have time to go into all the, the various weird theologies. Some people believe Jews are automatically saved, or dual covenant theology, all kinds of abominations. And I call them abominations because they're preventing my people from hearing the gospel. I'm so pleased that people believe that I needed the gospel. And they shared that message with me. That's why I'm here today. So the gospel is to the Jew first. Then my third and last point that I'm fully persuaded about. I am fully persuaded that in reaching Israel, and by the way, when I speak of Israel, I don't only mean Jews in Israel, I mean all Jews. In most cases, in the New Testament, when it's referring to Israel, yes, it includes the Jews in the land and the physical land, but it's speaking of the Jewish people worldwide. As Paul the Apostle says in, in, in Romans 10.1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. So, at that time, Israel wasn't an independent state anyway, like it is now. Even though, you know, there were many Jews living in Israel, so what was he talking about? My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel means for the Jewish people, wherever they live, is that they may be saved. So I believe that in reaching the Jewish people, that we are going to see the greatest revival and outpouring of the Holy Spirit that mankind has ever seen or ever will see. I know that's a very bold statement, so I better have Scripture to back it up, and I do. <laughs> you know, here, here's where people get confused, and, you know, for, for many years before I was on staff or on full-time ministry or whatever, I worked for 20-plus years in the retail and, and uh, book industry and printing and except many things like that. But I still did then what I'm doing now. <laughs> Why? Because it's my conviction. I pay for my own tickets and go to Argentina or wherever it was and, and minister there in different parts of the world. Why? Because it's my conviction. All my vacation, instead of taking vacation, I'd go and I'd, I'd preach to the, to the Jewish people. So many of them come to the Lord all around the world. Why? Because I'm fully persuaded. Not only that my people need the gospel, but that in them being saved, we are going to see the greatest awakening that mankind has ever seen. Let's turn to Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 11. Oh, so this is the obstacle before I read the scripture that I come up against. So I, what, my, what my strategy was, or, or the Lord gave me, is, is go to churches and share with pastors, especially churches where there's a Jewish population and people know Jewish people. And, so, and wherever you go, there's a few people that God has touched concerning the Jews. And say, I'll say to them, there's people in your congregation who have Jewish friends. I want to equip them and teach them and train them how to reach the Jewish people. If you'll let me teach at Sunday school, preach in the Sunday morning service, put me in a teeny little classroom with four people, I don't care. Just, just let me share this message. For years and years, just knocking on doors, as well as having a full-time job. And then uh, what I I'd often hear is, well, no, we, we reach just everybody. You know, we reach everyone. Just, we just preach the gospel to everyone. It's just kind of a general kind of thing, you know. And, uh, and I realized when they were saying that is, and they didn't mean it this way, but they were saying, well, we preach to everyone except the Jews. That's what they were saying. Because... Jewish people think of the gospel as a Gentile message. They don't think it's relevant to them. They don't think that it's a message that in any way touches their lives. I remember hearing the gospel preached on the streets of, of Hillbrow in Johannesburg, downtown Johannesburg. And this guy was preaching, and, um, and there was someone who'd been delivered mightily, and he was sharing his testimony. And I remember standing there thinking, wow, I'm so happy that the Gentiles now have a way to get to God. I'm so happy that it's such a blessing. And honestly, I felt zero conviction, zero that it's, this is for me. I just thought I was just so delighted that now finally the Gentiles have a way to God. 
gospel. But as Jews, we go directly. We don't need to go. It's, just, it's very draining to have to go through somebody else. That's the way I thought, you know. It's, like, it's, just, it's kind of a waste of time. Let's just go direct, you know. Now, obviously, my theology was completely off, so don't quote me on it, okay? But that's what Jewish people think. And so if you're going to reach Jewish people, you've got to reach them in such a way that they understand that Jesus is the promised Messiah of Israel. You all follow me? That he's their Messiah, not just a Messiah that, that lives in the Methodist church or the Baptist church somewhere, you know. Okay, Romans 11, 11. I say then, speaking of the Jews, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now look what it says in verse 12. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And then let's go down to verse 15. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Okay, here's my point. Does God love the Jews more than the Aborigines or the Japanese or the Australians, or... No, he doesn't. But here's the thing, though, that I want to emphasize. There is no other people group mentioned in Scripture where the Bible says when that people group comes back to God, it's going to be life from the dead for the world. Are you following me? Every soul is just as important to God, but there's no other people group that God has said, when this people group starts coming back to me in a great way, we are going to have life from the dead for planet Earth. <laughs> Talking about an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, second to none, like mankind has never ever seen before, that literally is going to usher in the second coming of the Lord. So why so much emphasis on reaching the Jews? 14 million people in a world of over 6 billion people. It's a fraction, numerically, mathematically. <laughs> but God's not interested in our math. <laughs> but he says, when that little fraction begins to come back to him, it's going to be life from the dead. In fact, I love the way he emphasizes the point. I love the word picture here. He said, if they're being cast away, in other words, when they rejected the Messiah as a nation, although many accepted him, but when they rejected him as a nation, the world was reconciled. <laughs> Through the Jewish rejection of Jesus, the world was reconciled. In other words, the path was opened up for the Gentiles to come to the Lord. That's through them rejecting him. The world's reconciled. So you see the logic here? The logic here is saying, well, if, if the world rejecting him and they reconciled, well, what's going to happen when they accept him? <laughs> and then he goes on to say, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now, I know if I say we're going to have revival, you can have 10 Christians, and each one will picture what revival is in a different way. Some will think, well, revival is falling down. You know, revival is shaking under the power of the Holy Spirit. Revival is people being very happy. You know, revival is people weeping and being terrified. I mean, just, you can, you can have, you know what I mean, the whole spectrum, the whole gamut, you know. And all of those might be manifestations of revival in some shape or form. But the bottom line is, we, that we can all agree on, is that revival is life from the dead. <laughs> that we can all agree on. Whether there's death in your marriage, and life comes into your marriage, that's revival. If there's spiritual death, you're in bondage to sin and you get set free from that, life comes to your life, that's revival. You bring the gospel to people who are in darkness and bondage, that's revival. It's the light of God. It's the life of God coming into the nations and into the world. So you say, yeah, but that's the New Testament. Can you, is there anything in the Old Testament that backs that up? I'm pleased you asked. And I haven't got time to go into them all yet, but let's, let's go to, uh, to Zechariah. In chapter 8. And we're going to close on this in a minute. Zechariah chapter 8. 
Let's start in verse 20. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I read that scripture, I'd have a mental image uh, of a Jewish person who maybe looked like a Hasidic Jew, you know, and then ten Gentiles kind of, whatever, like grabbing his arm or his sleeve saying, come, take us to God. That would kind of be the mental image that I had in my mind. And then I read it again, and it said, in those days, ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man. Then I thought, okay, let me just go into the Hebrew like I did with Psalm 22. And so I got my uh, indigenous Hebrew expert there, Mark Anthony. Uh, He's working as an intern with Jewish Ministries, and uh, he's grew up speaking Hebrew in Jerusalem. He's fluent in Hebrew. And I said, look, I I want to see that it really says in the Hebrew what it says here. Because I need to look at this a bit more closely. And what it says is what it says here. This one is an accurate translation. That ten men from every language of the nations. Now, I really need to do a study on how many languages there are, but I believe it's thousands. And it says this in the Hebrew. So 10 people from each language group, each language of the world, are going to grab onto one Jew and say, come, take us to your God. Look, I'm no mathematical genius, but that's thousands and thousands of people for every one Jew coming to know the God of Israel. So maybe you say, yeah, but that's the millennial reign and that's this, this, this time. It doesn't matter when it is. We get so technical. It doesn't matter when it's going to happen. But in order for that to happen, that one Jew that they're going to grab onto needs to know God first. Can we all agree on that? (laughs) Because otherwise they're not going to say, come take us to your God if he doesn't know he's God, (laughs) obviously. You know? Can you imagine thousands of Paul the Apostles? You see, what, what we forget is that it was Jewish believers that died and shed their blood to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul the Apostle was beheaded in Rome. Thomas was beheaded in India. To this day, there's still a d- denomination, not to mention the souls, in India that are still founded by him. And it's because God loves the Gentile nations, because he loves the world, for God so loved the world, that he brought the gospel to the Jew first. And it's because he so loves the world that he's bringing the gospel back to the Jew first, so they in turn can take the gospel back to the nations. Amen? Let's pray, and I'm going to hand it back to Pastor Alan. Thank you, Father. Lord, I just thank you so much, Lord, for, for your word, Lord. I thank you for this gospel. Right now, every head bowed and every eye closed as, I, as I'm praying. And I, Before I even go any further, it's possible that we all believe this here. But if, if there's anyone in here that you haven't received Jesus yet, you don't know that if you were to die today that your sins are forgiven. If that's you, just between you and God, just lift up your hand because I want to pray with you if that's you before we go any further. If there's anyone here that has not yet received Jesus and you want to receive him today, just lift up your hand. I see your hand over there. I'm not going to rush this. Okay, let's you put your hand down. Let's pray together right now. We want to pray together. Say, Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sins. I receive you now my Lord and Savior. I thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You know,
The second thing I want to pray is, is that if the Lord has touched you concerning the Great Commission, yes to the Jew first because that's God's plan, but if the Lord has touched you,